Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out today to learn a little bit about filing personal income taxes. Does everyone see the, the presentation okay? Great, thank you. Um, I want to take a quick minute to introduce myself and the, um, the wonderful guest alum, uh, Oglethorpe alum that we have with us today. My name is Marissa Atencio. I'm the Assistant Dean of Students and Director for Global Education. Um, I am a person who loves taxes, um, never thought I'd say that in my life, but I have a lot of history with um, taxes. It's how I met my spouse. It's how I got into the field of international education and decided um, you know, that my passion for working um, with international students and scholars was driven or, or grounded in, in leading um, volunteer income tax support program nearly 20 years ago. So um, I never thought I would say I love taxes, but I do. Um, not because I'm an accountant, but just because I know taxes are complicated. So I'm really excited today um, to have a guest with us because uh, we do have an expert or someone who's way more of an expert in taxes than I am. So I'm going to um, let Jose introduce himself and tell, tell you a little bit about him and his um, business and, and participation today. Yeah. Hi, everything. Thanks, Marissa, for having me here and uh, Peter. Uh, so yeah, um, my name is Jose Franco. I graduated from Oglethorpe University in an, with an accounting degree. So um, I uh, started uh, Franco Tapsis in 2016. Uh, well, I was actually in, in school still uh, getting my bachelor's degree. And, you know, I've, I have a passion to, to help individuals file their taxes and, you know, obviously to um, uh, students. Um, and also dreamers or, you know, anyone that can uh, get some value from uh, also filing taxes and also just to be compliant. So um, I graduated from there. So and I always kept uh, Franco Taxes alive as a business. And um, after I graduated, I worked for two wealth management firms as a tax planning associate and a senior accountant. Um, and now I'm here actually full time at Franco Taxes um, every day. I'm helping uh, individuals and small businesses uh, file their taxes on time or tax planning or tax questions, anything like that. So yeah, th thanks for having me. Absolutely. And Peter, do you wanna just say hello as well? Sure. Uh, hi everyone, I'm mostly gonna be men in the chat today. So if you have questions, let me know. Uh, but I work in global ed as well. And as many of you know, I work with, uh, you know, a lot of our students with different immigration statuses or some of our undocumented students our F1 visa holders. And uh, I personally find taxes pretty tricky. Uh, and I know it can get even more confusing when you're trying to figure out how immigration status can, can kind of tie into these things. So, uh, so happy to, to have our experts here. And uh, I think Jose is going to have a a ton of great advice for us. So um, can't wait to hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, and then also Franco Taxes, you know, we have uh, over 300 clients. Uh, we have uh, uh, one contractor and then two tax partners. So uh, including myself. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Wonderful. So um, today we're going to try in one hour to introduce you to the tax system in the United States, some tax terms and concepts, um, different filing status or options related to filing taxes, and make sure that everyone is aware that there is a taxpayer bill of rights and really talk a little bit about what that means. Um, you know, the objective today is not to file your taxes. We can't do that today while we're, um, while we're um, talking about this. But we do want to help make sure you, you leave or you gain um, a little bit of, of greater understanding of your responsibilities as a, a taxpayer, um, different deadlines or um, resources that are available. And then we're going to touch a little bit about scams and identity theft, because while it's not about filing taxes, it's a critical part of just being uh, responsible with some personal information and being, um, you know, aware of some of the, the scams, phishing, and identity theft that is out there that really does target individuals um, in the communities in which this content um, is targeted. 
So let's talk about taxes. Um, we have a saying in the US, there are only two things certain, death and taxes. Um, I hate to start with that, but you know, the, the, the reality is in the United States, um, the tax system is um, unique to the US. It has a, a structure and a um, set of laws and a historical context that is rather complicated, not unlike the immigration realities. And so I appreciate, Peter, you mentioning that. This really is intended to try to connect a little bit of the immigration and tax um, relationships. And so we're going to do our best to summarize or touch upon some things to support individuals who hold a variety of immigration statuses in relation to filing personal income taxes. The most important thing to consider <clears throat> filing taxes is making sure that a thorough tax analysis is done. Um, just because your friend filed taxes in a particular way and was able to do a particular thing really does not equate um, to the next person, right? So your friend did it, so you'll do it. That's a pretty dangerous thing to do. And again, I think Jose can probably give a, a number of examples why I'm not going to. Um, but it's also why we're not really going to get into filing your taxes, but more so the big picture of what it looks like, because a thorough analysis is needed to help you file your personal um, forms or make some decisions around what forms and what, what paperwork is needed. In the United States, um, we have a tax year that it goes um, in line with our calendar year. So January 1st to December 31st is the tax year, and we look back. So right now we are looking at tax year 2020, but individuals are preparing paperwork or doing things in 2021, considering the last year, okay? So we're always looking back to the previous year when we're thinking about filing taxes. We're not filing taxes for the income that we earned from January 1 to now in 2021. We're thinking about last year. Um, in the United States, we have um, both federal and state taxes. Um, there are some states in, in the U.S. that don't have personal income taxes or don't collect personal income taxes. So depending on where you live is going to determine what you need to do. And so in the United States, we do have um, um, the IRS or the Internal Revenue Service is the federal agency responsible for um, tax compliance. And then in the state of Georgia, we have the Georgia Department of Revenue. And we're gonna give some of those links to resources um, in a minute, but it's important that those terms are going to be used. Um, what does filing taxes really mean? Um, so again, it is about forms or paperwork that is going to be done by an individual generally with some support. That's why we have people like um, Jose accountants <laughs> out there. It can be through volunteers. There are websites. There are lots of things we're going to talk about, but we appreciate having a human being like Jose here with us today um, because you're filing paperwork that helps you um, map out or demonstrate what your tax liability is. And we're going to you know, talk about that term liability in a minute, um, but understand that that's what this process is. Um, there are some individuals who can claim exemptions from um, resident taxes. That's another part of what we would say as filing taxes is exemptions or establishing who you are as a taxpayer. So there are some forms for that as well that may not be about your income, but just who you are as a um, taxpayer in the United States concept construct. Yep. Sorry about that. And I was gonna add a little bit on the tax analysis part. So yeah, yeah, everyone's situation is different. And you know, being a, a, a tax uh, professional, sometimes I get clients that come in and they say, okay, well, my friend got $2,000 back or something. So everyone's situation is different and they may have, you know, uh, more withholding than you or, you know, earn less and more credits or out. So there's a lot of things to explore on, on everyone's situation. Um, you know, and, and, and also um, um, in, in terms of uh, uh, filing methods too, you know, there's different filing statuses and we're gonna go over that too uh, because everyone gets a different uh, uh, standard deduction depending on their filing status. 
or um, some people uh, may get education credits and we're gonna get on that too. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, yeah, I think the, the variables in individual filing are really great. And so really, mm -hmm. we want to emphasize some of the, the terms and the language, but a thorough analysis is really going to evaluate you and your circumstances. And that's what, um, you know, is most important. Yeah. This year, um, the United States government, the IRS and the state government both decided to delay our deadline for or filing the tax paperwork. It normally is in April, mid-April, and this year it's been um, bumped to May. Last year it was bumped to July. So the good news is um, we're doing this workshop with a little bit more time um, for all of you to, to look for, for guidance and complete the paperwork that might be necessary. Okay, so some concepts. So I think Jose is going to go into way more detail, but I, um, you know, high level to just get us introduced. You know, we have this term called taxable income. What is taxable in the United States? And in the U.S., at the federal level, might be different than the state level, right? So take into account that things like wages or a salary, wages and salary sometimes are, are a similar word used, but can have a different meaning in some instances as well. Tips, investment income, maybe assets that you, you have, um, dividends that come from interest or investing, um, unqualified or taxable scholarships. These are mm -hmm. all potentially be taxed in the United States. But again, variability, it, it, there's a lot of things that tie into whether or not these apply to you. So again, to, to reinforce what tax liability means, it's the total amount of tax that the IRS or the Department of Revenue says that you are responsible for paying in a tax year. So it's not just a random number that comes out of the blue. It's not one number, one size fits all. It's really unique to you. And it, it, there is a formula. So that's why, you know, it's mathematical. Jose does a lot of math. <laughs> <laughs> um, that go into this, a lot of um, components. Um, it's not random, but it is unique to you. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, taxable, you know, um, there's a earned income and then there's unearned income. And so in there, you can see salary, wages, and tips. Those are earned income. So there, those are, th that type of income is tax, uh, ordinary income tax rates. So whenever you hear, you know, uh, politicians or or anyone talking about tax rates a lot of the times they're talking about ordinary income tax like oh I'm in the 37 percent 12 percent you know 24 percent all of those they're, they're referring to that so um, and, and it doesn't also mean that you're taxed at 24 percent all the time it's just ranges of income it's that extra dollar after a certain amount that you're taxed at that rate so your effective rate, your average tax, may, may, it's actually lower than your actual um, uh, marginal tax rate. So um, wages, they're taxed at ordinary income. And um, when you look at the tax tables, you will see that marginal tax rates uh, starting at 10% and going all the way up to 37%. Um, after sometimes when you're in the 37% or you have a million, now you have AMT, which is, you know, the, the alternative minimum tax in case you have tax efficient investments, you know, so investment incomes, unearned income, um, you have dividends, uh, investments like capital gains, those are also capped at 22%. So if there's a doctor making 600K, you know, or, or 650K, they're paying 37%. But Wall Street investors who only earn capital gains, they're paying a cap of 22%. So, and sometimes if their investment earnings are lower than, you know, if you're single under 40K and if you're married under 82K, you're paying 0% tax if they're long term capital gains. So, it's different type of taxes too, depending on the income, if it's earned or unearned. And that's how you get to that tax liability. There's also um, deductions, you know, um, above AGI. So whenever 
you have wages, tips, investment income, all that adds up to total income. Then you have the standard deduction and you also have um, adjustments to income. So if you made an HSA health savings account contribution, you can deduct dollar for dollar to get to that taxable income, which then creates, you know, that tax liability. So, uh, yeah. Jose does <laughs> very complicated taxes for lots of individuals. We hope that um, the type of tax forms and the type of tax um, analysis for most students is generally a little less complex, but there's a lot of variables still to consider. And so um, one of the, the big ones that comes up um, for individuals who are in the US on a visa is a tax status. Are you considered um, to be um, a resident for tax purposes where all of your worldwide income is taxable? Or are you considered a non-resident where only US sourced income is taxable? And there's something called a substantial presence test used to determine tax status. For individuals, um, and, and Oglethorpe uh, enrolls uh, many who hold a student visa, there is a five-year window of presence in the United States that you have non-resident tax status. And then that substantial presence test begins to um, kick in and you may turn to becoming a resident for tax purposes. And there are pros and cons to that. A resident for tax purposes is not at all tied to immigration status. So there are no immigration benefits that come from being a resident for tax status, but there are potentially some um, tax related options that become available in a resident status that are not when you're a non-resident for tax purposes. The hard reality is for some students, it's a lot worse to be a resident for tax purposes because there are some benefits or there are some exemptions and again, this is why the complications of filing taxes involve that that thorough analysis. Yeah. Good question yeah. in the chat under what is taxable. Uh, this comes up a lot is uh, how do I know if a scholarship is taxable? So I, a lot of the times when someone goes to grad school, they may be receiving, you know, like a stipend. And so for that, most of the times you get like a W-2 because they're paying for your uh, uh, school, if you're receiving like FAFSA grants, things like that, those are not taxable. Um, I haven't, in my experience, I haven't seen that many. I've only seen like ones in taxable scholarships and it was related kind of to like grad school. When that individual was in grad school, they were receiving some kind of like payment. Uh, I guess it was like a stipend in the they will receive uh, like um, like an allowance for living expenses and all that stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so one of the quick ways that I've um, learned to, to help students think about it, when you receive a scholarship and that money is paid directly toward tuition or mandatory expenses, it's not taxable. Mm -hmm. You receive a scholarship and that money can be applied to your... Um, your balance that could include things that are not mandatory expenses, let's say like books or other things. It's possible that it would be um, uh, taxable, but again, it's not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the amount that you use for unqualified educational expenses, may right. that portion may be taxable. So I think Jose is right. Traditionally, <laughs> taxable scholarship becomes an issue with graduate education and graduate students. And athletes at big schools that have NCAA programs where they get full scholarships that cover allowances for buying sneakers and clothing and travel and those things become taxable. So mm -hmm. for our population and for our student community, taxable scholarships are um, not very common. So, so just to follow up and be clear. So let's say I have a scholarship that covers my, my tuition but then I get a you know two hundred, three hundred, four hundred dollars for for books or expenses like that. Um, that's probably not taxable, or is that one of those things where we need to ask more questions? It could be taxable, but again, it, it, it's pretty easy to find. So this is where Jose probably will say it more eloquently than me. There are all sorts of ways to manipulate how you do things, 
to minimize your tax liability. Yeah, yeah. So, and um, that's one I, of the things we would try to do. If it's going onto your student account, the scholarship funds go to your student account and you use it to pay direct expenses, it's not taxable. Mm -hmm. Unless you go out there and buy a brand new car that is totally unrelated. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, also just a little quick fun fact on the TAT status in a presence test. So for non-resident aliens, well, no more aliens, right? Thank you. Because <laughs> I'm actually documented and I got- No more. Yeah. I never wanted to use it and now I don't have to. Yeah, now I'm not gonna use it. So for non-resident taxpayers, um, if you marry a US citizen before the five year, um, you can elect to be treated as a U.S. resident so that you can file a joint return with the U.S. resident spouse. And so you no longer have to file that 1040 and R that we're gonna get to in just a minute. So that's yep, just- Yep, the kind of closer connection. Yep, lots of really important parts about residency status. Mm -hmm. So some other yeah. terms and forms that are really important and that we hope you have some questions that we can answer. Um, so, to complete tax forms, an individual will either need a social security number, which you file a, a SS5 with the social security administration. And that number is used by an employer to, to withhold, you know, they use it as the reporting number or the ID number to withhold taxes, but it's also then used on the IRS and the Department of Revenue forms to file taxes. But it's not the only way. Okay, um, individuals are not guaranteed or there's not um, always a reason to be eligible for a social security number, but the IRS, they want your money, they want your taxes. And so ultimately, or they want you to get the benefit, you know, to be um, taxed at the right liability rate. Let's, let's put it that way. So it's important if you don't have a social security number, um, the, the ITIN, the individual tax ID number, um, is a way to ensure that you can file a tax return. The W-7 form is the IRS form, and I want to be very blunt. The process to apply for an I-10 is rather complicated and even more so in COVID times because some of the traditional mechanisms that were in place for in-person applying are limited at this point. So I'm going to leave it at that. And I think we'll, we'll allow questions later if you have them about the I-10. But I want to move on to the W-4, which is the form that an, an employer or an organization uses to ask you how you want to um, have taxes withheld, the status for your withholding. And then the W-2 is also an employer form you also could have a 1099, but a form that shows um, the taxes that were withheld during that period is, is the W-2. So those are both forms that, that tie into income and earnings and how taxes are um, withheld. The W-8-B-E-N is a form that is used either by a U.S. bank you can notify them with this form to stop reporting any interest that you are earning on a, sa a savings account, or you can use it to notify um, the government that you would like to claim treaty benefits for a scholarship. So we talked about what's taxable scholarship. Sometimes treaties for non-resident protect a scholarship from being taxable. So that's why it's nuanced and complicated and not a one size fits all answer. Um, FICA is a term that you may hear or may see. Um, FICA is basically the, um, the federal program for Social Security and Medicaid um, benefits. So it is the way that the United States government collects um, money into a big pool of money that then is distributed through the Social Security Administration um, and, and Medicaid for, for those benefits. I put that there because there are instances that individuals pay those taxes in error. And it's, it's pretty common. It's common with students and it's common um, with individuals that are non-residents for tax purposes. And so if you look at your tax documents and you see FICA 
taxes being withheld, it's a good opportunity to ask, is that correct? Let me evaluate, let me get some support on that because you can file what's called an 843 re return with the IRS to request a refund. So you could get money back, money that's yours, your money, not, not the US government's money. And so I wanna make sure that folks know that that process does exist. Um, it's, it's not a difficult one to do and it is one that um, I encourage students to, to um, go through if you're seeing taxes withheld in error. The form 8843, and, and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit in the next slide as well, is a form specifically for non-immigrants in the United States who can identify an exemption from the substantial presence test. So there are specific visa types, F, Q, J, maybe one other that I don't always remember, but it's a form that's used to basically identify, I want to be exempt from the su substantial presence test. It's what gives the five years to an F1 student to be a non-resident taxpayer. And then Jose has talked about standard deduction for itemizations, and there are all sorts of variables or not variables, um, scenarios that go into which standard deduction you're eligible, what type of itemizations you might be able to um, claim on your taxes, but that's why that analysis, they're going to factor in um, your circumstances to determine what is better for you, what's going to ensure that your tax liability is the lowest. Jose, what did I miss? How can I um, do, do more on that slide? What else, what else <laughs> to complicate taxes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the W-4, I mean, you covered it really well. Um, W-4, whenever you get a job, you're going to be filling that form out where you put in your filing status. If you're single, married, head of household, qualifying with or whatever status you're in. And, um, uh, and that's what will produce that W-2 form uh, at the end of the year, obviously. Well, next year, uh, before January 31st employers will then be sending those forms out to every um, employee that worked and earned wages throughout the year. Um, now, uh, standard deductions, um, when you're single, you used to get 6,500, 6,300, it changed every year. It, it changes, uh, varies, but now you get 12,400 as of 2020. Uh, next year will be 12,600 for 2021. Uh, when you're married, you get a 24,800 standard deduction. It's just doubled. And then if you're head of household, you get an 18,400 standard deduction. And what that is, is basically just exempts you for, from paying taxes, federal taxes on, on up to that amount. So whatever your filing status is, uh, up to that amount, if you did pay federal taxes on your W-2, you will get a refund back pretty much for the difference. So and that really I, applies to resident taxpayers. Mm -hmm, yep. And so, and then itemized deductions are, um, let's say you have more, um, more deductions than the 24,000 if you're married. Let's say you have uh, donations, you have um, property taxes you paid in, also state taxes on your W-2, they're capped at 10,000, but you have mortgage interest, all of those things, you add them up. And, and if they're over 18, I mean, uh, 24,000 or whatever your standard deduction is, depending on your filing status, then you can choose to itemize. Now for international students, um, I believe they can, um, use the state taxes that they paid as itemized deductions on their 1040 NR um, form every that's year. That's it. But that's oh. So one of the things that um, I didn't say in the earlier slide, but Jose really, you know, hit it for me. Our tax system is um, complex and it prioritizes or benefits certain individuals in the U.S. It's, it's the reality. Um, individuals who earn certain types of income get certain types of benefits that others don't get. 
Um, it's very political. It's not unlike the immigration system in that way either. It's very political. So one of the things that happened in 2016 was um, the tax law changed and non-resident taxpayers no longer can claim the standard deduction and can only claim itemizations that are rather limited. And so the tax system was changed in a way that disadvantages non-resident taxpayers much more than it did in the past. And so it's a reality that non-resident um, taxpayers have right now. There are still um, some benefits of being a non-resident, but they're smaller than they were before. Yeah, yeah. So now there's no standard deduction there. You just have to use whatever you paid on your W-2 to Georgia as a itemized or donations, you know, things like that. Yeah. <laughs> so this slide is very small. And so I apologize um, that, it, that it is so small, but um, this is a visual that I've sent out to our F1 student population um, previously, but it really tries to highlight both the tax calendar and sort of the analysis, a basic analysis about whether or not a uh, a non-resident taxpayer will file a tax return or simply file the form 8843 to notify the IRS of being um, exempt from the substantial presence test. I have a template form 8843. I can share it with any student that asks. I've sent it in, in some emails um, previously. It's, it's a basic form that, that asks questions about your stay in the US and your address. It's not actually complicated to complete. Filing a tax return, which is the form 1040 NR or NREZ, is a little bit more complicated. And so this really, this matrix is intended to try to take you down the path to think about what type of uh, paperwork is going to be needed for you in your individual situation. And again, I'm happy to do this type of analysis with every student and then get you support to actually file the report with someone like Jose. Talk about those forms. And I'm gonna let Jose cover these because this is the part I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so 1040 EZs. Um, actually now we only have, you know, 1040s and 1040 SR, but 1040 EZs, um, those were the short form Sometimes they were, one, well, most of the time they were one page um, uh, and it just showed wages. If you had wages, it would just be, and you were a dependent of someone else. So the um, IRS got rid of the easy form altogether? Yeah, the easy now, yeah, after 2018, they try to make it one page with schedules only. And now it's kind of, it turned into a two page now. <laughs> so uh, when Trump was elected, uh, in 2018, he tried to say, you know, okay, we're going to pass something that's going to make it a one form, but then he had all these schedules. So, you know, it, it was the same thing. Uh, um, so, yeah, I mean, but the, uh, everyone now files a 1040. There's no 1040A, um, you know, 1040, the, uh, it's just a 1040 or 1040SR or 1040NR. And I think actually NR does have easy um but um yeah and so 1040 that's where all your income gets consolidated in one place and so you will have total income adjusted gross income tax tax liability you will have credits if um credits payments as in payments or actual credits you know like the american opportunity credit and stuff like that if you're a u.s resident for tax purposes um, and so these forms are just, you know, a place where all your income is consolidated in one place and we calculate your tax liability and your payments and your total income. And so that's where we determine if you're entitled to receive a refund or you are short and you have to pay them a little bit back or a lot if you're in withhold throughout the year. So that, that's what these forms are. Um, they have to be filed every year according to the deadlines, you know, as Marissa mentioned in previous slides, uh, they have to be filed by April 15 or now May 17. Um, 
There's also another one that is not here, but it's called 1040X and um, that will be an amended. So if there was a mistake on your tax return, we can follow 1040X to correct that error and make all the changes and your tax liability or credits or payments will be adjusted accordingly. Um, now, I haven't touched the 1042S that much, but I know it's for US, um, um, I think it's US residents with foreign source income, is that right? The so it's used, um, Oglethorpe, I don't think issues them at all. It's not a requirement that a university does, but again, in a graduate um, education environment or places where there are a lot of scholarships for um, like full scholarships awarded to a student athlete, the 1042S form can be used to um, report scholarship that is exempt from tax or, mm -hmm. or um, income that is exempt from tax by treaty. So it is really a specific form for a non-resident taxpayer. Um, and again, highlights um, particular types of um, income or scholarships that is protected from tax. Okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, then there's the 1098T, which is, you know, every college student should get one of these, even if you didn't pay for, uh, it, even if you didn't have any out-of-pocket expenses, it, that's just going to be a reconciliation of how much you were billed or how much you paid and how much you received in scholarships. If you were half time, um, you can get this form. If you are a 1040 NR, um, you cannot um, claim the American Opportunity Tax Credit. And so what the American Opportunity Tax Credit, that's a credit that you can re uh, not um uh, that U.S. residents uh, can receive for up to 40 years um, for up to $4,000 in qualified educational expenses like tuition, equipment, books, supplies, all of the above from that. And they, they can receive a $2,500 uh, tax credit and a thousand of that can be refundable. And it also obviously has uh, income limits so who can receive that. And if you're a dependent, then you will have to give that form to your parents or uh, whoever you are dependent of so that they can get this credit. Now, the lifetime learning credit, that one comes in after undergraduate. Um, so now let's say you were a, um, a non-resident for tax purposes and you graduate from Oglethorpe, you go to uh, graduate school. Now you're a US resident for tax purposes after the five year, you can actually get this lifetime learning credit. It's up to $2,000 that you can get. Um, it's not refundable, but it pays down your tax liability. So if you have a $2,000 tax liability and a W-2 that you paid in $1,000, uh, you have that standard deduction too, but you, um, you will have that lifetime learning credit that can cover some of that tax and you may receive all the withholding that you paid in your W-2. Um, now also, if you have, the only thing that it doesn't cover, let's say you're 1099 uh, as a subcontractor, or you did Uber, something like that, then it wouldn't pay down your self-employment tax. And what self-employment is, self-employment tax is basically another form that you can, like another way that you can pay the FICA tax and uh, also unemployment taxes. So it's a 15.3% that, you can't use the LLC, the lifetime learning credit to pay down, but it does pay your federal taxes um, up to $10,000 in qualified expenses for graduate students. Um, and then here's the other form, 1099s. There's 1099s pretty much almost for, <laughs> for a lot, like even for debt cancellations, you know. Um, so 1099 miscellaneous, um, last year, they still have that one but um they used to report in 2019 and before that they used 1099 miscellaneous for non-employee income royalties and all of those things uh rents paid uh, lawyers well, who receive payments they will get 1099 miscellaneous now the most common 2020 starting is the 1099 neck so non-employee compensation um and so that one, anyone who's an Uber driver, 
DoorDash, um, Contractor, um, they will get that form. And that's um, a form that they most likely did not pay any withholding. And they will use that form to, um, to take it there to, to their tax advisor or do their own taxes and pay the self-employment taxes plus state and federal taxes. Now, 1040, uh, 1099 hours, let's say you graduate from Oldwater, you are, let's say it's your fifth year and, uh, or actually even if, if, if you're in Oldwater um, and you, um, they signed you up for a, uh, uh, a 401k. And so if you're contributing to 401ks and they're giving you a match for that summer internship, um, you will potentially get a 1099 R at some point because you may roll over that money after your job to another bank or, you know, uh, as an IRA, obviously. Uh, but if you take it out and you spend that money, then you um, uh, receive that form 1099 R with a specific code that would tell you if it's um, premature distribution, meaning that it's too early for you to take it out before 59 and a half. So then you have to pay that 10% penalty, but there's also exemptions that you can use that money to pay qualified education expenses and not be subject to that 10%. So that one is just retirement income. Any type of retirement compensation uh, will be reported there. And now 1099 G, if you were unemployed um, for you, uh, you as residents, um, you can get actually, and I'm not, I'm, I don't know too much information about uh, international students if they can get unemployment. I, I don't, yeah, they can. Yeah, so, but if you're a U.S. resident or you're after your five year and you were unemployed, you will get a 1099G for government payments received. Um, also, if you receive a refund for Georgia when you itemize, you will get that 1099G. And I've seen some international students actually get a 1099G because they have to itemize. Um, well, they also, sometimes they receive a, a, a standard deduction though in Georgia. Um, and so, but a lot of the times they will get that 1099G for the refund that they got through the state. 1099 interest, interest income, you have a market savings account, you may get 10 bucks. If, you or, or more, if, if you get 10 bucks or more, you have to report that interest as income. If it's under 10, you don't have to report it. Um, you can just let it slide and there will be no issue. But if you what have a random other number, account, $10. Yeah, <laughs> so but if you have other bank accounts and they all combine to more than $10, then you have to report it. Um, so yeah, and then dividends, and actually 1099, I put 1099 interest dividends in B. Uh, for brokerage, you know, proceeds received uh, from capital gains, because I've seen a couple international students or uh, just, you know, millennials, Gen Z, and now signing up for applications like Robinhood, Robinhood, Webull. I was just going to say GameStop, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, GME. So, yeah. And, and so all of those, uh, if you receive dividends, then you get a 1099B. You, if you, uh, just sell stocks and trade it, then you'll get the 1099B. And if you're a 1040 in R, uh, a non-resident taxpayer, then you have to report all that income. And I've seen students where they only have investment income because they had a social security and they signed up for Robinhood. Um, and then now they have to report those gains or losses. You know, if you have a loss, you can report it and it will just carry over. So whenever in the future you have Again, it would just offset with the gain. So, uh, yeah. So if you sign up for those apps or for, for a brokerage account, you may have interest dividends or, or a, a 1099B all consolidated in one form. Now, 1099 SSA, I just put it there because it is common, but um, due to uh, disability income or uh, just retirement income, uh, some parents receive that. Um, so that's why I put it there. Um, if they're over 62, they can take early retirement and receive a 1099 SSA for, for payments. Um, and then also disability if, if, they're, if they have a condition where they can't work, things like that. So, um, now there's these uh, publications, the 519, 
that one is a helpful publication. So, and also the IRS has publications all the time. They probably, every time there's a tax law or some kind of guidance, even sometimes they do a publication just to kind of explain uh, instructions on how to report a W-2 or a 1099 NEC or R, you know, so publication 519 just kind of gives international students or non-resident taxpayers um, guides on, you know, um, how to report income or what they need to report and things like that. I haven't looked into it really. I was say, these are light reading material. Don't waste your time. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big fan of making sure students know that there, there are resources, right? That the U.S. Mm -hmm. publishes materials that you can use as resources and check um, particularly. Yeah. And so the 519 and the 901 are really very long documents, but they go into great detail about non-resident taxpayer um, considerations and then tax treaties. And again, there are some countries where the tax treaties are really, really critical and can, can minimize your liability for taxes to nothing. And so it's mm -hmm. worth um, at least being yeah. aware that this exists. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to add one more thing on the 1099. Um, I know international students, you know, they have to go through the school to get internships and stuff like that. But I've seen where sometimes, you know, occasions where they got a 1099 and they weren't an employee. So even if it's income that you weren't supposed to receive, you still have to report it for tax purposes. And the crazy part is, you know, you have to report income even if you weren't supposed to, even if, um, if it's from illegal activities, and I'm, I don't mean to bring it up, but income has to be reported no matter from what activity it's coming from, because, you know, uh, um, it, well, Jose, I appreciate you bringing that up. And I also want to stress, so Peter and I do have a role at the university related to student visas. And so this is why it's important to have external resources because Jose and others can help you with filing your tax returns and, mm -hmm. Peter and I don't need to be a part of those conversations. Um, and so the other part that I wanna make sure we're getting a little bit short on time that we get to is that taxpayer rights and responsibilities because there's some com critical components in there that I think tie into to this piece. So yeah. filing um, status and, and maybe just really quickly highlight um, you know, that these are, I wanna highlight how, how these are very different things and why they, um, you need to know what status you're going to have. Maybe we won't go into detail if that's okay, Jose, because I think the next slide is way more important. <laughs> yeah, I, I just looked at the clock. It's 12.53. <laughs> it's hard to do taxes in any um, short amount of time, but this to me, because of what you were just saying, is so important. So do you mind sharing uh, a little bit more about this? Yeah, yeah. So the Taxpayer Bill of Rights this is publication one of the IRS. So if you look up on Google publication one, you will see the 10 taxpayer bill of rights. And so these are all the ones that you're seeing right here, the right to be informed. You know, the IRS has to mail you out correspondence to you um, if, you know, for, to be informed if you're gonna receive an audit or something like that. Uh, you're, you have the right for quality service so calling the IRS, you know, they, they have to provide you with um, answers or guides on how to, you know, navigate a, a tax letter that you receive um, or things like that. Um, and that's why they have the IRS hotline that you can call. Uh, I think it ends in, it's like an 800 number, but it ends in 1040. And so um, you have that right to quality service. You have also the right to pay no more than the correct amount of your tax that you owe after your credits. Um, so you um, you also have the, the right to challenge the IRS's position and to be heard, the right to appeal. Um, and, you know, appealing, you that's when you can go to the U.S. tax court, uh, the district court. Um, and then I can skip down a little bit to the number nine because you have the right to retain representation. So you can actually choose an individual, whether it's your tax practitioner, your tax advisor, an attorney, or a family member that can 
discuss with the IRS about what what's going on, what's needed to fix a tax issue. Um, you have the right to privacy. You know they can't just disclose your information unless they have guidance from the law or you know from uh, you know or without your consent. So privacy is big, confidentiality, and then also to a fair and just tax system. So you have all those 10 rights. Um, so and yeah. The confidentiality one is so important because filing your taxes with the IRS, the IRS cannot share your tax filing status or any of the components that you've indicated in your tax filing forms to any other federal agency um, outside of um, you know, a, a law that, that permits it. And at this point, what that allows or ensures is the intersection of immigration and taxes, there's still a divide, right? That mm -hmm. there's no um, direct relationship. And so the Department of Homeland Security, ICE, other agencies do not have the ability to ask for um, your tax returns. Um, you do get asked to submit them with some types of immigration petitions to demonstrate eligibility. So there's, mm -hmm. It, it can be muddied or be, um, you know, complex, and that's why it is so important to involve good resources and experts to, to make that decision about what is the best thing to demonstrate, you know, to the Department of Homeland Security something about compliance with taxes. Is it, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and, and also us as tax practitioners, we cannot disclose client information, um, you know, at all times unless we have your consent, you know, to share it with a specific individual or send it to, you know, a bank because you're trying to buy a home or things like that. Um, but we will need your consent as tax practitioners. We have to keep your information private and confidential. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're gonna, um, I'm gonna go really quick, I think, through this. I don't know if there's anything you wanna hone in on, Jose related to the responsibilities? Yeah, yeah, so you are obviously responsible to make payments by the deadline, so by April 15th. Uh, sometimes, and, and actually the US has a pay as you go system. So um, you pay, you have to pay your taxes as you go. If you're a contractor, you have to pay quarterly estimates so that you're not subject to an underpayment penalty, you know, and things like that. But if you just pay them by April 15th, you would just have a small, or depending on your income, um, uh, penalty, underpayment penalty. And then also, if you don't pay your taxes by the due date, that's when you can be subject to a half of a percent penalty for not paying per month. It starts at half of a percent, and it can go up to 25%. There's also a failure to file. Uh, penalty that starts at five percent of whatever your tax liability is due, um, and then it can go. It can be five percent per month up to twenty-five percent also. So as long as you're staying compliant, I mean, those are obviously your responsibilities to file. Um, obviously, the IRS has um, there's a statute or the, not a statute, but they have rules where they can't collect your tax after a certain amount of time uh, uh, or there's a, also a timeline that you can't claim your refund after three years or two years after you pay your tax. So if there's uh, uh, an amendment, amended returns, you can only go back three years or something like that. Um, you are also responsible to keep records of your tax filing returns for a certain amount of time. Um, and obviously for, um, non-residents, I will advise them to keep them for as long as they can because you never know when you will need them. Um, you know, um, you have to be diligent, you know, you can't file fraudulent returns or, you know, something claiming credits that you're not entitled to and things like that. So, um, yeah. Uh, oh, and then uh, as Marisa mentioned in previous slides too, um, filing form 8843 for non-immigrants, you, you have to file that uh, as international students if you don't file the 1040 NR. 
And uh, we to file the 1040 and R2, by the way, um, that's when the passport is needed. We will have to calculate how many days you were present in the, present in the US. Um, you, we need your uh, foreign home address and um, the type of visa that you're holding, your phone number, and then your US address. Um, so yeah, that's for Form 8843. And then now this slide resource is available to you. So you can, you obviously have TurboTax, but you can't click on the free file that, that has the same 1040 that every other resident uh, taxpayer can. You have to file the 1040 NR if you are a non-resident taxpayer. So um, you have to be very careful, you know, I know Turbo tax is everywhere on commercials. And so, um, yeah, just make sure that you are, if you're filing it through an online uh, company like Turbo Tats or Nature Agent or Block or Liberty Tats, Tats Layer, all of those Tats Act, just make sure you're filing the 1040 NR. If you don't see the 1040 NR anywhere, then you're filing the incorrect form. Uh, Sprint Tats. Um, I, I've heard of them. They're good for international students uh, for filing the, uh, the 1040 in ours. And now you also have VITA, so the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance. Uh, and I know that there's a couple locations too um, throughout Atlanta that you can go to and then a credentialed tax preparer would be helping you out filling out those forms. Uh, and I believe they're free. To you um, and yeah you can use this link right here in the description um, I believe Peter will put it on the chat and you can find um, you know find a, a credential taxpayer that tax preparer that can prepare your taxes and help you out with answers concerns all of those things and now you have other resources like myself um, Franco Taxes. So we've been in business since 2016, and um, I've helped out a lot of students also from Ogletorp, Georgia State, Georgia Tech, NSI, and so on. Um, I can help you also file the 1040 in R and um, your form 8843, or whenever you graduate and you're still present in the US after five years, we can switch you over to. Um, the uh, regular resident return. Now, if you have a 19 or if you don't have a 19, then we can also help you apply for the ITIN. Um, I do want to say though that for ITINs, um, I will advise you to go to a, a CAA so that you don't have to send out your passport with your visa on it. So if USPS loses that, then, you know, now you have to apply for a new one or wait long time have headaches and so on so it's very important um, that maybe you should go through a to a caa we are actually waiting for the irs to give us our caa number so we will be a caa soon uh, and we can help you do that without having to send your uh, two forms of identification um, um, forms of id uh, or your passport by itself without physically sending that. We would just certify those documents and send the W7 with copies of, of those forms. Then you will get your item. Now, after you graduate, let's say you get a job, you apply through to get your, uh, your social security. If, if you're, let's say DACA, and you had an item back then, and you were you know, filing a regular 1040, you can actually, there's a way that you have to do go about um, switching over to the social security to be able to transfer over any social security or FICA payments that you made through your W-2 just so you can have social security credits and stuff. And we can guide you in that process. So now, um, Franco Taxes, we offer virtual and in-person tax appointments. We do a free um, tax analysis for you when you're a first time uh, prospect. Um, and obviously, if you become a client, then you get access to me all the time 
to email me and ask me questions. If I, we don't know the answer, we do the research for you and uh, we provide you with answers. Um, we help um, individuals, investors, you know, anyone who's a young investor trading or has Bitcoin, you know, so those kind of things, we help them out uh, in filing. Um, the, at the IRS, you know, they're looking at, um, you have to actually answer now if you're trading uh, cryptocurrencies, you have to answer that in the first page of the 1040 now. So uh, we help individuals do that. Small businesses, we do payroll, bookkeeping, through QuickBooks, Costco for payroll or ADP, uh, 941 filings, quarterly estimates for contractors. All that we also, like I said, we do items in the uh, FBAR filings. If you have a foreign bank account or multiple foreign bank accounts in at any time of during the year, you had over $10,000 in dollars, you know, uh, and the IRS, by the way, posts the currency trans, um, um, translations, not translations. Uh, yeah, the yeah, yeah, they they uh, post them on the website, and so if you at any time during the year had over ten thousand dollars, you have to do a FBAR filing, and that's just for informational purposes. After two thousand one, the Patriot Act, now you have to report that. Uh, first time filers, students, we help them out, uh, so that way you create a base on if you're ten forty an hour, or resident, or you know, we just kind of set you up. And so for the future, you know what you should be looking out for. A 1098T, maybe you never picked it up if you're a resident alien. So we can go back. And if you're independent, we can amend those returns or your parents' returns so that you can they can claim those credits if they fall under the income limits. We do renewals also for um, items. Um, we do file 1040NRs electronically also for states. So we're um, electronic return originators. So we can e-file any state pretty much um, with the exceptions of some, but we have an EA uh, in staff that can also file those states. Um, all credits, you know, additional child tax credit, child tax credit, earned income credit, um, and, uh, and more. So yeah, and contact information is there. So. Yeah, I think thank you for highlighting all of the like again layers and complexities and the different types of scenarios. I think it's really helpful um, for folks to know that you you do a cross, and I think that's a it's a pretty unique thing because a lot of um, tax accountants firms really focus on resident taxes only, and so your um, unique understanding of non-resident resident and the immigration status piece is so is so critical. So thank you for highlighting that. Yeah, yeah course. <laughs> I want to talk really quickly. We had two really great questions and I know we've gone over time, but I want to really quickly just highlight a couple of resources and some comments about scams and identity theft because they're out there. They're targeting um, students. They target senior citizens. They target immigrant communities or individuals with, um, you know, um, names based on names, based on resident locations, all sorts of things. And they really target the ID number. So the ITIN and the social security number are confidential. They're numbers that really you should only use for specific purposes like filing taxes, like um, ensuring that your employer has what they need um, for tax withholding. And, and my best um, advice to every individual is not to share the number unless you know how they're going to use it and you trust who is using it. Those are always questions that I ask um, if someone has a, a place on a form for a social security number, leave it blank and see if they ask you for it. If they don't, win. If they ask for it, challenge them. Ask them why they need it. What are they gonna use it for? Most of the time it's because they use it for a credit check or a credit history or a criminal history or something of that nature. Maybe there's an alternative. Work toward an alternative. I'm, I'm sharing my social security number as little as I possibly can these days. And that goes the same with any personal identifiable information, your date of birth, your passport number. And if someone calls you and they have 
a piece of your personal identified you know, information, that's a good red flag that there's a concern there. Most people aren't, most businesses, most um, federal agencies aren't doing these types of things on a phone call. They're sending you a letter, like Jose said, and they're saying, we need you to schedule an appointment to do X, Y, or Z, or we need you to, so, so really the phishing um, online, the phone scams, um, they're, they're growing and they're, they're really things we want you all to be aware of and to, to question, right? They don't be, um, threatened because they often are very threatening. Some of these scammers um, take the time to ask them a few questions, ask for a phone number where you can call them back and do it with somebody else so that you can really, um, you know, have the support that you need. Um, know that these resources that I've listed here on the, the slide, these are all different either emails or websites where the federal government is collecting information about scams because it is um, and it is a problem and it is something that um, legislation and other pieces are starting to happen, but we're really behind in, in, in terms of protecting personal information. So I do want to get to the two questions that were submitted. Um, the first question was a, a reminder about the tax filing deadline. So normally it's middle of April, but this year um, it did get bumped for both the federal government and the Georgia Department of Revenue to May 17th, 21. So this year it's May, but understand in the future, it's probably gonna go back to April, mid-April, usually the 15th. Okay, the other question, Jose, I think you can answer um, more eloquently than me because it is one about that liability question. So how do um, you respond to the question, what's the minimum amount of money I need before I have to start filing taxes? It's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, so that one, um, it all depends on what type of income, right? So if it's interest, obviously you receive $10, you have to file so you can pay taxes on that $10 interest. Now, if you have wages, uh, meaning you're a W-2, you get a W-2. So um, as long as you earn $20 in tips or wages, you can file because you paid it withholding maybe and you can claim that refund back. But um, um, if you don't file, you're just kind of giving the government that money because let's say you're a u.s resident you get that twelve thousand um, dollar standard deduction and you made 11k and you actually pay the right amount of taxes in a little bit more if you don't file um then the irs will basically just keep that money um, because you were entitled to a um a refund um now if you're a contractor or you know receive a 1099 as soon as you earn as soon as you earn six hundred dollars you have to file that if you have investment income you have to file your investment income uh, i'm not sure about that like the, the threshold on the investment income but i'm sure is um over ten dollars also just kind of like a very low amount just to calculate your liability um, this is why that that tax analysis and doing that quick consultation um it, it does take time but mm -hmm. yeah but it all it all depends on what type of income you have. If you have a W-2, which is the most common one, because it's ordinary income, just an employee or tips, then um, you should file because maybe you will get a refund of the withholding that you paid. Now, if you didn't pay any withholding, then you also have to file because you have to pay the taxes that you didn't pay throughout the year. <laughs> It's, uh, I, I can't give like a straight answer because it all depends on what type of income, uh, if are you an international student, are you a US resident uh, and things like that. So, uh, but I can tell you though, for 1099s miscellaneous or NIC now, uh, non-employee compensation is $600. Anything that is over 620, I think they bump it up. Um, you have to file so you can pay FICA. Uh, and unemployment taxes, so self-employment taxes, in other words. Um, All these yeah. numbers in your head, um, Jose Franco, <laughs> better, better, better you than me. Um, one last question, <laughs> and I do think we'll, um, you know, close it up for today. But we, I want to stress that that Peter and um, I, Global Ed, we're collecting questions. We're trying to work on putting together um, a, a, an additional FAQ that we can make sure is available on our website. This presentation um, 
like I said, being recorded will go on the global education playlist. And so um, Peter and I will post that in our Instagram and, and send it out to folks so you can view this later. Um, this last question is a little bit more about, again, a tax analysis. If um, Which form would I file if I've been in the US for almost five years, but I only had an F-1 visa for two of those years? And so again, it's about what visa you held before, and it, it is about whether or not you're going to be exempt from that substantial presence test. So um, my guess is that we can do a quick analysis um, myself or, or Jose and give you a sense of whether you do the, the 1040 NR non-resident or the 1040 resident form. Probably an N, but again, probably a good opportunity for an analysis there. Mm -hmm. And also if you had income, then maybe you would do the NR. But yeah, it's we'll we'll take a look at that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jose, I really, really, really want to thank you again for um, agreeing to partner to do this workshop. <laughs> way, way more um, useful than it would have been if it had just been myself and, and Peter. And I know that students are, are really going to appreciate having this um, information to to later. I know that um, having you as a resource, we're really grateful um, to um, connect students to you. And I look forward to doing something in the future when time allows. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm open to it. And uh, I'm glad that and, and happy, obviously, that you brought me. Uh, I am an Oglethorpe alum and I love Oglethorpe. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so yeah, it's, it's great um, being here doing this presentation with you guys. Wonderful. And thank you to the students that participated today. We look forward to helping you with questions and, and um, getting you on your way to filing taxes this year.